name is Cedra Martinez. I'm the Executive Director with the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. We are here to uh, get to know the candidates for Wisconsin State Assembly's 26th District. Um, thank you both for your willingness to participate in the conversation and certainly your willingness to um, serve in the 26th District. Uh, we know that um, elected officials have quite a bit of a tough time these days, so just, you, just your willingness is really, we need to say thank you. Um, thank you for everyone in the audience and thank you to everyone who sent questions in advance. Um, I'm gonna go over the rules very quickly. So rules today, I will ask a series of questions and each candidate will be given two minutes per question to respond. The timekeeper is right here up front. Um, she will let you know when you've got 30 seconds left and when your time has expired. Um, once we've gone through the questions, if we have additional time, we will ask additional questions from the audience in the room. And then I will give two minutes for any closing comments that um, you guys would like to share. So first, let's meet the candidates. Um, Republican incumbent Terry Kotzma is joining us. He was born and raised in Sheboygan County, graduate of Sheboygan County Christian High School, and received a Bachelor's of Business Administration from Dort College and an MBA from Marquette University. He is a former president and chief executive officer of Oostburg State Bank, where he worked for 33 years. Terry has served the 26th district since 2014 and currently serves on several committees. Terry and his wife, Nancy, reside in Oostburg and share three children and six grandchildren. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Next, um, our Democratic candidate today is Lisa Salgado. She has worked in healthcare as a medical assistant for 30 years and has served as a frontline worker and supervisor running a medical clinic as an employee health nurse. Lisa also serves on the Ellis Historic Neighborhood Board and the Mayor's Interna International Committee for the City of Sheboygan. Lisa has spent time volunteering at Brown County Jail Celebrate Recovery Program. St. John's Homeless Shelter has been a foster parent and is TEFL certified to teach English as a second language. Lisa and her husband, Henry, currently reside in the City of Sheboygan. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So we will uh, go right into it. Um, First, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the current state surplus in Wisconsin. Um, Lisa, I will um, ask you first, given the record balance of the state surplus, how would you suggest we manage these funds going forward and why? Well, Wisconsin has a $4.3 billion surplus. This is a good problem for Wisconsin to have. Um, right now, it's in a rainy day fund. But in many ways, today it is raining. And as someone who works in many towns in our area, I really see people struggling. I would like to see a mental health counselor in every school building. I would like to head off some of the crises that we're facing before the issues occur. We also could use the money to fund our infrastructure. There's areas in our district that don't have broadband. It's really difficult to run a small business or any business and um, continue, continue your education if you don't have access to internet. Um, also, some of the public schools, such as Random Lake in my district, they need to upgrade their building. And they're looking at a referendum of $30 million this year. And some of that funding could help our small rural schools. So I believe in funding for the future of our schools and our infrastructure. Thank you. Terry, given the record balance of the state surplus, how would you suggest we manage these funds going forward and why? Yeah, thank you, Deidre. Um, I'm privileged to serve on the Joint Finance Committee and the due to really good budgeting over the last uh, decade or so, the state's financial condition is, is, is good. And also because we were opened uh, during COVID, I think revenues were more than what was projected. So currently, the, the, as of June 30th, the surplus was about 4.5 billion. It's projected to be 5.5 billion. But again, that's a projection. Uh, it's, we don't have that in, in the bank yet. Uh, but, but things are, are looking good. So how, how would I propose that we use the surplus? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, if, if we have 
too much money or more money than what we projected means that we collected more from our taxpayers than what was projected. So I would propose that we do uh, some sort of a tax cut. And, and I've been uh, working on this, and the tax cut that, that I would propose would be uh, an individual tax cut. Right now, we have the highest uh, marginal tax rate of 7.65. Uh, actually, Minnesota's higher than us, Iowa's higher than us, but we are higher than Illinois, we are higher than Michigan, and uh, so we've, we've cut income tax the last couple of budgets, but it's really that top marginal rate that needs to, that needs to come down. And so that's what I would, I would propose. Uh, uh, also, we need to do something about the personal property tax. Uh, personal property tax is an old tax that was done um, centuries ago based upon desk, desks and chairs, and it's, it's onerous, uh, and we've, we've chopped away a little bit at that personal property tax. Uh, but I would propose, that right now it's worth about $188 million to municipalities, and I would propose that we do away with that also. We're going to need to be funding education, uh, and, and so um, I would propose that we uh, put some money into that also. So, thank you. Thank you. Terry, um, I will direct this next question to you first, and we're going to transition um, into business <coughs> a little bit. Sure. The lack of available workforce has plagued our communities for many years. How would you propose we work to solve this issue going forward? Would you suggest we do anything differently? And if so, what? Yeah. Uh, brain drain, so-called, you know, has been occurring for, for, for decades. And, and uh, often, I imagine maybe a lot of you too, you, you maybe went away to college, maybe you went to the big city to, to experience uh, something else. And then when you, when you have kids, when you have a family, you find out, hey, Sheboygan County is a pretty good place to live and a pretty good place to raise, raise your family. So uh, uh, we need to, we need to uh, um, provide incentives for, for young families to be here. I, I applaud the, the work and the recognition of SCEDC as far as uh, more housing units uh, that was done in, in the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. Uh, also, uh, uh, we need to do more when it comes to uh, technical education uh, to, to provide uh, those sort of careers for folks. Um, uh, also, I, I'm going to come talk about taxes uh, on and on today, and, and one thing that we see is, is retired older people moving to Florida or moving to states that, that don't have taxes, income taxes, and so I, I think that we also need to, to um, continue to, to look at reducing the taxes to, to encourage people to stay here also. But it's, it's, it's promoting, you know, it, this is just a great place to live and, and, and work and to play with the lake and there's so many features that we have around here. We just need to continue to promote those. Perfect. And I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you oh, had yeah, no. your thoughts, so that was my fault. Lisa, um, I will uh, share the question again. The lack of available workforce has plagued our communities for many years. How would you propose we work to solve this issue going forward? Would you suggest that we do anything differently, and if so, what? Well, I'm proud to say that Sheboygan is 10th in the nation for manufacturing. However, we have between 2,000 and 3,000 jobs open at a time, and we're also facing 10,000 people leaving the workforce every day in this nation. In order to get young families to our area, we need the best schools. That's one. That's one reason that people move to certain areas so their kids can get a good education. We also need to fund our public education and local colleges. What drives the workforce is good quality people. And here in the, we, we have in-state college tuition freeze since 2013. So local colleges cannot increase their budget at all and they're forced to shut down programs and degrees right in the middle of students taking them sometimes. If we want to recruit and keep the best workers and talent, we need to use state funds to fund the freeze. This keeps college affordable for Wisconsin students and it benefits the businesses in our state, in our community. This is something that government has been failing at for the last decade. 
We need a living wage in Wisconsin as well. Our minimum wage is still at $7.25. That was 14 years ago. I'm here to support and raise the minimum wage. At the end of the day, we need to look at funding education and wages. And Wisconsin used to lead on this, and I think we can do this again. So, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We've also heard a number of um, talking about manufacturing and, and other industry in the state of Wisconsin either leaving and or expanding in states other than Wisconsin. So Terry, what do you believe that the state of Wisconsin can do to encourage our businesses to stay here and expand here? Sure. Um, I would, I think it was maybe about a decade ago that businesses were leaving. Now we're hearing more um, businesses staying. And, and for example, I was at Masters Gallery just the other day and, and you know, they, they did an expansion on the south side of the, uh, of the county and, and they did look at other states, but they made the decision to stay here in Wisconsin. And so uh, uh, also our, our, I, I would like to propose a, a uh, cut to business taxes also, which would encourage uh, businesses to stay in Wisconsin. So in addition to the personal property tax that I talked about previously. Perfect, thank you. And Lisa, what do you believe that the state of Wisconsin can do to encourage businesses to stay and expand here in our state? I actually agree with Terry as far as giving tax breaks to local businesses. Um, but we also need to close the dark store loopholes. There's some big box companies that want to be taxed as if, their as if their building was an empty warehouse. And that's putting the burden on property tax owners. Um, also, child care access is an issue. I worked with a physician who, after she had her baby, she couldn't find any child care here in Sheboygan. So she actually, actually ended up moving out of the state. So if we want to keep providers here and we want to keep business people here, we need access to child care. Also broadband, again, there's rural areas that are trying to run a business with slow or no internet service. So that's something here in 2022 should have been addressed a long time ago. Um, I think Sheboygan's doing a lot of great things. We're doing youth apprenticeships into the high schools for STEM and construction, hospitality and manufacturing. And it's giving kids a pathway. Once they get out of school, they have some type of work ethic and background already. Um, I launched a small business here in Sheboygan through the County Economic Development Center through UWGB. It's a free service. So if anybody has like a great idea for a business they want to start here in Sheboygan, I would offer to utilize that. So I believe there are a lot of opportunities here in Sheboygan and that our community is doing a good job supporting small businesses. Thank you. We are going to transition our, our subject again. Lisa, I will direct this question to you first this time. In light of the Dobbs decision and the effect of potential changes in Wisconsin related to abortion access, what would you advocate for as a suitable path going forward for Wisconsin? Well, a lot of people think that abortion is just a moral issue, but it's actually a medical and human rights issue. How can a woman call herself free if she doesn't have control over her own body? And we are living right now with an 1849 law, and the only exception is to save the life of the mother. I actually had a cousin this year who was diagnosed with breast cancer during her pregnancy. And there are a lot of gray areas right now and they ended up having to take the baby early so that she could get on chemotherapy immediately to save her life. She has two small children and a husband at home. And luckily for her, she was far along in her pregnancy where her child survived. But what if she was early in her pregnancy? Like, there's so many gray areas. Do we, how long do we risk her life? We don't know. It's very complicated. And also we're forcing young girls, 
now to carry a child full term. I work in the medical field. It's dangerous for teenagers and young children. Their bodies aren't developed. And um, it's just, it's appalling really. Um, we're also threatening to lock up doctors and nurses for doing the best job they can to, to care for a woman and her child. This law is going to make them hesitate, and it's dangerous for women. It can cost them their life. We've had special sessions to appeal the Abortion Act, and my opponent did not even show up. They gavel in, they gavel out, without even discussing women's health or providing any guidelines. We wanted to put it on the ballot, and they won't even let Wisconsinites vote on this issue. I'm here to protect women's health you and our freedoms at all at costs. Time, so I apologize. Thank you. But thank you. Terry, um, I will restate the question in light of the Dobbs decision and the effect of potential changes in Wisconsin related to abortion access. What would you advocate for as a suitable path going forward for Wisconsin? As, as a believer in federalism, which talks about states' rights, uh, I, I applaud the Dobbs decision where they put the decision into the hands of the states and the state legislatures to do that rather than the Supreme Court. So we, we the society, have, has made a lot of medical advances in the last 50 years. And so uh, we now know, you know, what, at 40 days, what, you know, the heartbeat. And, and uh, if I could tell a personal story, I had a niece that had spina bifida that was born in uh, about the early 80s. And at that point, their uh, parents had, had no idea that, that um, she was born with spina bifida until, until she was born alive. Just Two years ago, I had a nephew that had a baby, uh, and they did surgery in the womb to try to correct spina bifida. That's the, the improvements that have been made. And, and when I speak to, to the medical professionals in, in my family, and they explain to me how, how at the point of conception, there's, there's new DNA, that's a new life that is formed, and that is so, so important and so valuable. So I, I'm proud to, to, to stand with the pro-life groups, and, and I am proud to, to, I look forward to the debate that, that we're gonna have in the legislature on, on how uh, this needs to be uh, legislated. And I know there's going to be, uh, it's, it's a difficult situation, but, but I, I'm confident that we're gonna reach a conclusion um, that will be of benefit to, to uh, the preborn. So. Thank you. And as a follow-up, um, I will start with you, Lisa. Um, it was suggested recently that abortion access be put to referendum and the consti constituents given the ability to vote. However, that opportunity was denied by the current legislature. Do you believe that the voters should have the right to vote on this topic? I absolutely believe that Wisconsinites have the right to vote. How did these majority of male legislators think that they have the right to tell a woman what to do in their medical care and they're not even working in medical backgrounds and they think that they know better for women's health compared to a woman and her doctor? Um, this should, I feel like this shouldn't even be on the table. This is a woman's health, this is her decision. This is not part of legislature, this isn't a thing. Like, it's, it's your own personal body, it's your own personal decision, and that's how I feel. And I will protect women's freedoms at all costs, and this is for the safety of women. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Terry, I will restate. Sure. Um, it was suggested recently that abortion access be put to referendum and the constituents given the ability to vote. However, that opportunity was denied by the current legislature. Do you believe that the voters of Wisconsin should have the right to vote on this topic? We, we are a representative democracy. We elect our representatives. We, we are not a, a simple majority. Uh, so. Um, the, the proposal that was done uh, most recently is when we were out of session. 
and in the legislature adjourns and goes out of session on April 15 every other year, regardless of it's if the Republicans are in charge or the Democrats are in charge. We are never in session during election season, and the purpose, the reason for that is that uh, the public doesn't want us making laws and cutting taxes and then saying, well, vote for me because I just cut your taxes last month. We are never in session regardless of who the governor is, regardless of which parties are, are in charge. This is an, an item that, that we will be debating in the legislature, and that is the proper place for it, and so I, I look forward to that. Thank you. So um, lastly, Terry, I'll, I'll direct this to you first. Where do you stand on making available birth control to aid in the prevention of unwanted pregnancies? Birth control is a, is a legal subject. I'm in favor. I, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Um, so uh, there were uh, numerous bills, uh, or I should say, a bill that uh, uh, had uh, dispensing being done by pharmacies, and and uh, that was a, a bill that I supported. Um, so. Thank you. Lisa, where do you stand on making birth control available to aid in the prevention of unwanted pregnancies? Well, birth control must be protected at all costs. When the Affordable Care Health Care Act passed, they made birth control free for all women, and abortion rates plummeted. So if you're against abortion, you should want birth control. Birth control is also used for many other medical reasons, too. It's not just a, a religious, you know, moral choice. Um, pregnancy is still dangerous for women today in this country, especially for girls and teens. And there is no good reason why we wouldn't offer birth control. So why would we regulate it by law? This must protect, we must protect a woman's right to birth control. And as far as personal freedoms for women, the choice will be very clear in this election. Thank you, Lisa. We will transition and uh, talk a little bit about climate change. Climate change has been a hot topic across the nation, and here we are on November 3rd in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and it's well into the 60s. Terry, do you believe we should be concerned about climate change? If so, what do you think we should do specifically in the state of Wisconsin? And if not, what evidence do you have to substantiate your claim? Sure, uh, climate change, uh, if you look at the polling, it's, it's down uh, to about seventh in, in seventh or eighth, I believe, in uh, concern of, of folks uh, as compared to inflation and crime and, and education and other issues. Um, there's, there's, there's limits to what I think uh, we can do to control man-made climate change. The, the, the climate is, is always changing. We here in Wisconsin we, uh, can point to the glaciers and, and some of that. So at that time, the temperature was much colder. And we've warmed up since then. What, you know, what is the proper temperature? Is it is it what it was a couple thousands of years ago? Is that the right temperature, or is it today? Uh, I, I applaud uh, the work of the chamber uh, several years ago, when when there was some opposition or some concern about the uh, ozone monitoring and and some of the arbitrary uh, uh, indicators of that. When that monitoring was right on the Lake Michigan and. Uh, so it showed that, that a lot of that was done from, from uh, transport ozone from other states. And uh, so, so I, I uh, but um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, I, I look forward to that debate. So. Thank you. Lisa, do you believe that we should be concerned about climate change? If so, what do you think we should do specifically in the state of Wisconsin? And if not, what evidence do you have to substantiate your claim? Well, we are experiencing climate change here in Wisconsin. Our rainfalls are getting heavier. Um, we've gone from two inch rainfalls to five inch rainfalls, and they're more frequent. Um, we also have the highest cases of Lyme's disease in the country because of longer, drier, hotter seasons here in Wisconsin with ticks. Um, we rank 23rd in the nation for the worst ozone pollution. We have erosion of our shorelines, and homeowners are losing their land. 
we need to acknowledge cl that climate change is happening. I know my opponent might not believe that climate change is happening and that it will, and it will probably not be on his list of priorities, but as a state representative, I will listen to the DNR and fund them. This department, the DNR, has been cut and slashed and gagged. And that was back to prior administrations. We need local control to regulate our own wetlands and rivers. We need to hold big polluting companies responsible and not have taxpayers foot the bill on this. We need to end fossil fuel subsidies and switch to green energy. The bottom line is we must protect the Great Lakes and our environment because it impacts everyone's life in Wisconsin. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about um, education. Terry, um, if I can start with you. In a previous Q&A, I believe it was with the Sheboygan Sun, you shared that you meet regularly with superintendents from throughout Sheboygan County and that, quote, there is more money reaching the classrooms today than ever before and that parents need options for connecting their kids with education that work for them, unquote. Earlier this week, Sheboygan Area School District, the largest school district in the county, shared that the levy for SASD has decreased every year since 2016. However, the levy for private schools participating in the voucher program continues to increase, accounting for almost half of all private school students receiving funding through the voucher program. Do you believe that school choice should be expanded further and that private and parochial schools should be supported by taxpayer dollars? Well, I'm in favor of options for parents because they are, are in the best position to know what works best for their children. Uh, when I looked at the Sheboygan uh, school budget, you talked about the levy declining. Mm -hmm. what, what, what we're talking about is the property tax levy is declining. And the reason for that, so in other words, there's less money being charged or taken from the, from the taxpayer, from the real estate taxpayers in Sheboygan. It's because there's more money coming from the state of Wisconsin. We have revenue caps, and, and so the, uh, I think the number was 86 million compared to 81 million in the prior budget. So that's how much the, the state funding uh, in Sheboygan went up in this, in this current budget that we have. Uh, so in the last budget, we, we uh, the state, uh, didn't do as much uh, as far, normally uh, there's been about a $200 per student increase over the last several budgets. And it was less than that in the last budget because of all of the coronavirus and the ARPA dollars that were spent by the federal government, which as we look back now is beginning to cause inflation <coughs> nationwide. But, uh, for example, uh, Sheboygan Public Schools received $21 million. The city of Sheboygan received $20 million. The county of Sheboygan received $20 million. And then each, each individual government entity and each individual government uh, uh, school district also received money uh, based upon the number of, 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 of uh, people that there were in those districts. So. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Lisa, you shared with the Sheboygan Sun, quote, it is time to create a more equitable school funding system, unquote. Do you feel the current structure is not equitable? If so, what facts do you have to substantiate your claim? And how would you suggest we move forward? Well, our Wisconsin Constitution requires a free education and the same quality no matter where you live in Wisconsin. The voucher schools do not have to take every student. If a child has disabilities or special needs or language barriers, they do not have to take them. If a child goes to a voucher school and they don't get the services that they need and they go back to a public school, that money does not go back with them. At private schools, I cannot at attend their board meetings. I can't have a say in their curriculum. Their teachers don't have to be licensed and their schools don't have to be accredited. And you want me to send my tax dollars there? We have very few places in our society 
where you can meet all different kinds of people and where we can blend together as a community. Wisconsin used to be known for the best schools. Sheboygan Public Schools lost $4.3 million in one year to vouchers. It's not our teachers that are failing us, and it's not the kids that are failing. It's the legislature that has failed to invest in public schools. The property taxes are having to fill the gap, and it's putting the pressure on the backs of locals who are forced to ask for a referendum. This is very real right now in my district with Random Lake. They need building improvements, and they're asking for a $30 million referendum. We need transparencies about how much these vouchers are costing us on our property bills. Taxpayers did not sign up to fund more than one school system. It's really easy to say something is broken when you don't fund it. The best schools are fully funded, open to the public schools. Thank you so much. So let's transition and talk a little bit about safety and gun control. Elisa, if I can start with you. We are fortunate in our area that violent crime has been on the decline. Nevertheless, when we see all of those scary ads on TV, we have to wonder, is there really a problem? And if so, what can the legislature do to help keep our communities safe and secure? Okay, first I'd like to say that I do support the Second Amendment. I'm a multiple gun owner. I live in a hunting family. I have police officers and military members in my family. Um, but crime has been a money maker and a scare tactic for dog whistle politics. When crime is rising, it's because people are struggling. We need access to mental health care. We need affordable housing. We need living wages. We need to think of crime more holistically. So I'd like to focus on the positive. As a state representative, I would give more resources to the local municipalities. We need things to fund fire, police, foster care programs. We're not funding our municipalities enough. I've heard le local leaders say that they need help dealing with our protection and our services. We have to trust our local leaders to know what the needs of our community are. Our state representatives went missing nine months during the pandemic. We had the least active legislature in the nation. It was local board members and municipalities and clerks that stepped up to the place to listen to their community and give direction and services. So we need to give them the respect that they deserve. There's too much power and money in Madison right now, and if elected, I'd like to give the control back to the local governments, and the taxes need to come back to Sheboygan County. Terry, uh, do you believe there is really a problem? And if so, what do you believe the legislature can do to help keep our communities safe and secure? I believe there's a real problem in the urban areas. And uh, for, uh, in my conversations with local law enforcement, local sheriff, I'm um, happy to see what's, what's going on in Sheboygan County. Uh, I'm a firm believer also in the Second Amendment. I've been endorsed by the Second Amendment groups. And uh, we, at this point, I believe we have plenty of laws on our books right now. Uh, I'm opposed to no cash bail. Uh, we've had some proposals in the legislature to do that. Uh, there were numerous law enforcement proposals and, and bills um, that I supported in the legislature that unfortunately were, were vetoed by, by Governor Evers. So um, uh, I'm happy to be in supportive of law enforcement and proud of their support. Thank you. And as a follow-up, Terry, I will start with you. What is your position on universal background checks and the banning of military-style assault weapons in Wisconsin? Sure, uh, universal background checks, I think the, the issue with that is like with uh, uh, private sales, and, and I, I'm opposed to uh, universal background checks when it comes to private sales and sales within families. Uh, there, there are uh, background checks uh, at gun shows with licensed uh, gun dealers, and I, I believe that that is, has been uh, adequately addressing the, the, the uh, uh, issue. Uh, when, we, when we find uh, some of these crimes that are committed, 
in, in urban areas. Um, a lot of those perpetrators are, are prior criminals that shouldn't have firearms already. So, so um, uh, we, need to, we need to get tougher on, on those issues. Thank you. And Lisa, what is your position on universal background checks and the banning of military style assault weapons in Wisconsin? It's time to put the money aside and put the guns down and really look at the data. And 45% of internet gun sales did not have a background check. I'm not okay with our kids having to do active shooter drills. Background checks are a no brainer. You can lose your right to vote, you can lose your right to drive your car, and if you're dangerous, you should not have the right to carry a gun. My opponent supported a bill that would allow 18-year-olds to carry and conceal a weapon on private school grounds and places of worship without a background check. When we had a special session this year to discuss gun issues, the Republicans gaveled in and out without any discussions. When mass shootings are on the rise and domestic violence issues are occurring, the people of Sheboygan know what the right thing to do is. Even the vast majority of hunters favor background checks. No one other than the military needs assault rifles. Responsible gun owners everywhere want responsible gun ownership, and that starts with background checks. Thank you very much. Let's talk about another uh, hot topic, marijuana. Um, Lisa, I will start with you on this one. The legalization of marijuana for recreational use has been passed into law in several neighboring states. Please share with us your position on this issue and the reasons you would either vote for or against legalization in Wisconsin. I can tell you working in the healthcare field, even though marijuana is illegal, it's still being used in Wisconsin. Um, people are treating their anxiety, they're treating depression, trauma, um, pain management. In 2020, three out of four overdoses were because of fentanyl. If we legalize marijuana, we can make sure that it's a safe quality product. 90% of Americans think it should be legalized. It'll free up law enforcement, jails, courts. We can expunge past convictions. <laughs> We're losing out on a lot of tax revenue. The Wisconsinites are going to Illinois who made $443 million in one year. Michigan um, raised $111 million. We can use this tax money for mental health issues, schools, and infrastructure. So yes, let's make marijuana safer and let's reap the tax benefits to improve our community. Thank you. Terry, um, the legalization <coughs> excuse me, of marijuana for recreational use has been passed into law in several neighboring states. Please share with us your position on the issue and reasons you would vote for or against legalization in Wisconsin. Yeah, I, I've been opposed to legalization of recreational and uh, because the, the federal government, uh, that's also their position right now, if you, if you do deal in marijuana, it has to be cash. Banks are prohibited from having any dealings with, with marijuana. So it's all cash. And the fact that other states have, have approved them I, uh, you know, is, is just not respecting our, our Constitution. And, and I think that the, the jury is out yet on, on uh, all of the, the issues uh, with some of these states, like, like Colorado, that, that were pioneers in legalizing recreational. When, when they look back and, and try to count the social costs, uh, right now there you can you can test somebody for drunk driving, but it's it's not possible to test somebody for drug driving, and and uh, we we need to to figure that out. But some of these states that that have legalized it, I, I do believe that they are regretting uh, what they what they've done. Thank you. <clears throat> and as a follow up, uh, Terry, I'll direct it towards you first. Are there any circumstances that would allow you to reconsider your position? 
Well, the issue, uh, another issue is medical marijuana. Certainly there's anecdotal uh, stories of folks that, that have had cancer treatments and the only way they got relief was from, from, from marijuana. Now, uh, I'm not questioning their, their, their statements. Uh, the, the problem is that it hasn't been tested by the FDA. And uh, so um, until we see some testing on that, and you look at, look at the, the um, you know, the, the purity and the, the quality and the potency of, of marijuana today from where, where it used to be, there, there's just no controls over, over that. Um, so um, it's gonna be a lot for me to change my opinion, yeah. Thank you. And Lisa, are there any circumstances that would allow you to reconsider your position? No, I mean, I think there's many countries that have decriminalized drug use and they use the money for drug rehab centers and it's actually lowered their drug use in the country. They're holistically, the, health, the community is healthier because they have less drug problems now and it has been studied. So I, I would stay with my same opinion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Lisa, we're gonna talk a little bit about election integrity. I will start with you. After the 2020 election, several investigations from both the left and right turned up no substantial irregularities. Do you feel there was significant voter fraud in Wisconsin? And what evidence do you have to substantiate that claim? I do not believe that there was voter fraud in Wisconsin. Um, there were over 50 lawsuits across the nation and there, were, there was no findings of widespread voter fraud. Wisconsin spent almost a million dollars researching this and investigating this and that million dollars could have actually went to our schools. Um, election security officials said the election was the most secure in American history. And if you think about it, if the election was stolen, Wisconsin would not have had a majority of Republicans in the Wisconsin State Assembly and the Senate. Thank you so much. And Terry, after the 2020 election, several investigations from both the left and right turned up no substantial irregularities. Do you feel there was significant voter fraud in Wisconsin? And what evidence do you have to substantiate your claim? Sure, there, the Legislative Audit Bureau did a in-depth audit on the elections. Uh, we received that. The, uh, I don't know that there were irregular, what word did you use, irregularities? I would, I would say there's more uncertainties. And the, the reason for that is um, we had we had drop boxes uh, that were done, especially again in, in urban areas, and and this was stretching the statute. There's no it doesn't the statute does not allow for drop boxes. You have to deal with the the local clerks on that. Um, um, there was also an issue with private funding, so-called Zuckerbucks uh, from Mark Zuckerberg, who funded uh, get out the vote. Uh, efforts in in again in urban areas and and again we had nothing on our books that said they couldn't do it so uh, things were stretched when when they did that there were lawsuits brought uh, but again we we tried to fix that we I don't think it's proper that that private uh, companies should should spend to try to influence uh, uh, government to influence elections like that, uh, but but that was not uh, that was uh, again vetoed by by the governor. It, two days ago, we had we had an issue in in Green Bay where there was a lawsuit brought. I think it was the the Republican National Committee that objected because the poll watchers were unable to witness uh, um, ballots going into the into the. Uh, ballot box and so there's uncertainty going on and we need to be diligent. Now, I want to thank our, our local clerks that, and, and, and our county clerk and I think things are going very well here in Sheboygan County but I can't feel that same way about uh, Milwaukee area and Madison area. Thank you and um, as a follow-up and Terry I'll start with you do you believe there are current present threats to our election process? And if so, what would you do to eliminate them? 
again, uh, uh, I don't know about the pres you know this idea of the you know Russian in, uh, inter invasion and that kind of thing. I think that's stretched. I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, some of the f folks that that talk about the the um, voting machines being linked to the to the internet and there's there's uh, fraud going on there. I, I don't I don't believe that. Uh, but but. Uh, there are still bills and, and things that we need to do and that we've attempted to do to, to have inte election integrity, and I look forward to continuing with that in the next session. Thank you, Terry. Lisa, I will restate. Do you believe there are present threats to our election process, and if so, what would you do to eliminate them? I think in the future there could be threats to our election. Um, right now we have a Wisconsin Election Commission and it's a board of six people. There are three Democrats and three Republicans and they verify the election results. There's a movement in Wisconsin to uh, move that power to the Secretary of State and concentrate that verification process to one person. I think we definitely need to preserve and safeguard the Wisconsin Election Commission. There's also been a movement for multiple voter suppression bills in Wisconsin to take away um, a citizen's constitutional right to vote. This year in Wisconsin, people with disabilities should not have had to file a federal lawsuit in order to vote. Um, currently in in Wisconsin, only voters themselves can return an absentee ballot. And Sheboygan clerks may have to turn away friends and neighbors delivering these ballots. So I will work to ensure that Wisconsin has free and fair elections. Thank you, Lisa. And um, we're getting close to time, so I'm gonna ask another question and give opportunity for some closing remarks. Um, I will direct this question to you first, Lisa. It is no secret that Wisconsin has made the national spotlight for its inability to work across the aisle over the past couple of years. On what three issues would you be willing to buck the party lines in order to do what you believe was right? Um, that's that's a good question. I think um, I would, even for abortion, we, we cannot keep this law the way it is. It's very dangerous for women. And, and even if we can create some type of guidelines or s loosen that up, if the Republicans are definitely against abortion, we need guidelines. I mean, it's just so dangerous the way it is. Plus, we have people running for election that want to even remove to save the life of a woman. And I just can't, I just can't see that happening. Um, we have to work together to iron this out. We cannot leave this, this law intact just the way it is. Um, other topics, um, maybe marijuana, we could probably come to some type of consensus, even if it's medical marijuana and maybe not recreational use. Um, but I do have to say that it's hard to work across the aisle when there's empty seats there. We need both parties to show up and work together. When there's special sessions called, we need our representatives there to really talk about the issues. Um, we just can't leave constituents hanging and these things in balance. And the other thing, the other third thing would be education. You know, we do need to revamp the system. We cannot fund two systems and it's not fair right now. So I think we could come up with ways to probably equal this out and have some choice, but yet still preserve the funding of public schools. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Terry, um, on what three issues have you, um, as you've been in the role, bucked party lines in order to do what you believe is the right thing? Yeah, I think that 
it's a little bit blown up, the, the, the controversy uh, that makes for good headlines. We've seen that on the national level. On the state level, I can, I can tell you that one of my good friends is, is Democrat Evan Goike from Milwaukee. And we're on the Joint Finance uh, Committee together. Uh, he and I and our wives have gone out to eat. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, we get along remarkably well. We've, we've done bills together when, uh, when it comes to do with foreclosure uh, issues in, in Milwaukee. Uh, his neighbor, I knew about foreclosures. His, his neighborhood uh, was struggling like crazy. Uh, and, and we worked together uh, and, and had a bill done that improved uh, that process for for the Milwaukee area. So um, there's more collegiality than than I think than than what we like to see uh, in um, in um, in the media and stuff because that that's what sells papers. Um, as far as uh, where can we find compromise? Uh, uh, I would agree with Lisa. Probably uh, medical marijuana. Uh, is 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 one uh, when it comes to education. I, I, I Democrats and Republicans are all hearing from parents that they're dissatisfied with the test scores, and there has to be there has to be uh, more options that are available to parents. And I got to believe that that we're going to find some some compromise in that area also. Great, thank you so much. And to uh, give you guys some time for closing remarks, um, I will start with you, Terry, if you'd like to uh, take, I'll say, three minutes to share with us any closing remarks sure. that you'd like the voters to know. Uh, um, thanks to the chamber. Thanks to you. Thanks for everybody that's here today and everybody that's uh, watching online. Um, it's, it's a real honor and privilege uh, for me to, to serve in this position. And, and I take that very seriously. It's 58,000 people that that we uh, that I got to think about, and and that that so so uh, one of the uh, things that I'm proud of is is our constituent contact, and we send out a, an e-update. If you don't receive that, I'd urge you to go to, to my website and sign up for the e-update. We and that goes on while the session is is while we're in session. And uh, it's meant to be somewhat non-political and in informational, but we're, we're also proud of the efforts we did when there was unemployment issues, uh, when there's um, uh, issues when it comes to uh, licensure and such. Uh, but, but I just want to put a, in a plug for, for the, my colleagues, in, uh, for, or for uh, the Republican governor, Republican uh, the federal, Senator, uh, the key difference b between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is, is Republicans feel that there should be more limited government. Democrats feel that the government should be more in our lives and making more decisions for us. And, and I, I'm, I'm just not in favor of that. I'm in favor of free markets. And, and um, so, but I, I ask for your vote um, and, and I appreciate your, your, uh, your support. And, um, and, and again, it's been a, a real honor to, to do this. And thank you for, um, I, I just want to ask a question. Who's already voted so far? Oh, yeah. Okay, a few people. And who's sick of these commercials? <laughs> um, um, uh, I, want to thank, I want to thank Lisa. And you know, uh, this, uh, our, our, our election, I, it's been clean. There's been no mud slinging. And, and our, our budgets and, and don't allow for that, and, and our, our will doesn't, doesn't allow for that. But I, I wanted to thank her for, for running. I wanted to thank her for providing options uh, so that people can, can see the difference uh, between candidates, and, and thank you for, for doing that. Thank you, Terry. And Lisa, we'll give you three minutes. Well, I'd like to thank the Sheboygan County Chamber for hosting today's public forum and thank all of you for being here today. Um, the reason I'm running is because a lot of the main issues that people care about in Wisconsin are health related. Whether it's mental health or women's health or medication costs, these things are important. And I think we need more medical people in office to help navigate these things. I'm a small business owner. I've been a medical assistant for 30 years. I've been a supervisor. I work with budgets. I've worked with teams. I've been an employee health nurse where I've written policies. And I've been a frontline worker. 
I'm an advocate for my community. I understand the complex public health and economic challenges that we face because I see the impact every single day. Um, and I can see how healthcare policies are affecting us. Um, I'm here to serve my community and not party lines. I'm a candidate who will listen to my community. I, I work with my community every day. I work with people from all walks of life. And it's something that I really enjoy doing. I do feel that there is more you, that unites us than divides us. And um, I think that we can find a lot of common ground. We can just have common sense. Um, so I will work for you. I will show up. And I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, so please vote for me, Lisa Salgado, on November 8th. And thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And so with that, um, we're getting close to time. So uh, again, thank you to everybody who's watching. Um, this may or may not be live. We know we've talked about broadband today that sometimes our um, ability to put things out live stream doesn't always work in our favor. So if it didn't work live, I apologize and it will be made available um, for you to share out the recorded version. With that, tomorrow, Friday, November 4th is the last day for early voting. So if you're hoping to early vote, make sure you get it done by tomorrow. Um, and if not, then um, certainly make sure that you are um, voting next Tuesday, November 8th, and that'll be all for today. Thanks again.